Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Excited. All right, we are starting a brand new series today called Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. And the idea, the concept that I want you to understand is that grace and faith work together. Grace and faith, grace and faith, grace and faith work together. I got to give you a testimony. You guys want testimony about grace and faith? No. All right, we ain't going old school testimonies, but I want to give you a testimony, all right? Last week, Last week, we launched our capital campaign fundraiser, right, for some of the big projects that we're going to do, right? Yeah. Okay, so get, yo, you're not going to believe this. Has anybody ever believed to just find a check in their mailbox? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You ain't never had faith for that? Yeah. yeah, just get free money? All right, so check this out. We just found out from our payroll company that there's this thing called the employee retention credit that if you kept employees on staff for 2020 and 2021, that you get a tax, like you get a credit for that. Well, we didn't think that we, we um, uh, like qualified for that because we're a church, right? But no, nonprofits and churches qualify. Yo, it's like $500,000. $500,000! Won't he do it? Come on! You believe God for three million and he drops 500,000 day one. Day one. Come on, man. Grace and faith. Grace and faith. You know, you know what the problem is? is that a lot of us don't operate in faith because we don't understand grace. Many of us don't operate in faith because we don't think that we deserve the things that we want to ask of God. We look at our behaviors and we look at our mess ups and we look at our mistakes and therefore we know what we do. We know the thoughts that go through our minds. And because of those things, we do not operate in faith to ask God because we disqualify ourselves. Man, I disqualified myself from even going after this credit because I was a nonprofit. I disqualified me instead of just asking. Oh, my God. This ain't even in my notes. This isn't in my notes. This is God for you. We disqualify ourselves all the time. Therefore, we don't step in faith. So what is Grace. Come and shout out, what is grace? God's, God's undeserved, put up on the screen, God's undeserved, God's unmerited, God's undeserved, unmerited favor. Undeserved, unearned favor. It is God's love in action. You don't get what you deserve. You get what God wants you to have. Woo! You don't get what you deserve, you get what God wants you to have, right? Yo, seriously, straight out, my kids, they deserve coal in their stockings for Christmas. Don't they? Little booger. Yo, my son, my son will take a magazine and he'll take a marker and he'll circle everything in that magazine and say, no, I want this for Christmas. Yeah, which one, Poppy? All of it. Well, bro, you were on your phone watching YouTube for 12 days straight. You didn't clean up one thing. You don't deserve it, right? He didn't do anything to deserve a Christmas gift. But guess what? I want to buy him Christmas gifts. So regardless if he ever does anything to deserve a Christmas gift, my love for my child says, I will bless you exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could circle in a magazine. Well, then you're just going to spoil that child. 
do you not understand how spoiled you are as a Christian? That, 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 that it says that God will lavish you with his blessings, but do you know why we don't walk in lavish blessings? We don't believe we deserve it. We believe if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. That's not godly, that's karma. And karma is cultish beliefs. Woo! If you believe if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad, then you believe in karma. And you're not believing scripture. The Bible is broken up into two parts. The Old Testament and the New Testament, correct? We could also call it the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Do you know why it's called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? Because one is old and one is new. And the new one is better than the old one. Yes? Okay, listen. I do, I do like antique cars. I got a dream of owning a 1955 F100 pickup truck. You know, like, it's a dream of mine. But I will tell you, the Dodge Ram that we own for plowing the driveways and parking lots is better than a 1955 pickup truck. Right? My new truck has Bluetooth. Hey, somebody. My new truck has heated seats, somebody. Now, the old one, it's a classic, and I love it, and it's there, and it serves a purpose, and it's fun, and it's flashy, right? But it's old, and the new is better. We have the Old Testament, we have an old covenant, we have a new covenant. The new covenant is better, and it has new and better promises. And here's a problem, this is what happens in the church world, is that a lot of times we revert to old thinking and old ways, right? A lot of us in here said, we made promises as kids, I am never going to be like my parents. When I get older, I'm not going to do certain things. We've even come to things where we've changed our opinion about certain matters, but then when we get angry, we say old stuff. We say old words. Some of you have been delivered from saying dirty wordies. But get into a really, really nasty fight with your spouse and see if one of those dirty wordies don't try to come out. An old word, an old language that you've been delivered from tries to come out. Galatians 3, 1 through 5, this is what was happening in the church at Galatia. And Paul comes real hard with some real strong words. And I'm going to say this to, to the church world today, not specifically family church, but the church world today. He says, you foolish Galatians, you foolish church of 2021, who has bewitched you? Who has hexed you? Who has confused you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Did you get salvation by being a good person? Or did you get salvation by confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart? This is what he's asking. Because it's so easy for us to think that we live good enough to deserve what Jesus did. He says, who's bewitched you? No one can live good enough to deserve what Jesus did. He says, are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, you're now trying to obtain these things by, God, by human effort? He's like, you started out with salvation. You started out with the Holy Ghost. Now you want to make people earn it? And this is what they were doing. They were saying, hey, listen, well, I know the truth. I am doing what's right. But other people, they need to, they need to do more. Other people need to do more. And isn't that so easy from us to judge other people who sin differently than us? I'm just wondering if I sat at your Thanksgiving dinner, how many people I would hear you talk about behind their back. You foolish Galatians. Foolish Galatians. Foolish Galatians, he says. 
We wanna judge someone who sins differently than us, but we sin every day. You wanna keep somebody and make someone rise up to a different standard that you yourself are not living at, he says. He says, have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really is for nothing? Does God give his spirit, give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law? Is God good to you because you're good? Or because you believe in the name of Jesus Christ? This is so good. This is so good. This, this message, this message is what killed Jesus. This message is what killed Paul. This message is what killed all the disciples. This message, this message, the gospel of grace. Verse two has such a great definition of what faith is. It says, you heard the word of God and you took action by believing in the Lord. You heard the word, you believed, and you took action. That's faith. That's faith. Faith must be put into action. If you don't act upon what you heard, it's not faith. It's just agreement. There's a lot of people who believe there's a God. But not everybody lives for God. All right. We're saved by grace through faith. We receive miracles and healings and answers to prayers by grace through faith. You can't work up a miracle. You can't work up a healing. Miracles happen because God loves you. Unfortunately, sometimes we make it difficult. We, we put standards. Well, listen, God really wants to do this, but first you have to. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you are saved and you have access to all that God has for you. So let's look at this. We've got the law versus love. The law versus love. The old covenant was the law. The new covenant is love. Grace is what got us into the kingdom of God. And grace is what keeps us there. Listen, man, if you were ever raised in a church that every time you sinned, you had to then come to church and come to the front and confess your sin and get saved all over again, you didn't understand grace and you weren't taught grace. You were taught law. And what the law did, can, we, can I just be for real? What the law did, it kept you coming back to church and paying your tithe. It never set you free. It never set you free. It was bondage. It was fear. Fear of going to hell is what kept me going to church as a kid. That never made me want to love God. I did something bad one day, got kicked out of school, got, got seven day, uh, five days OSS, kicked out of school. My mom didn't even want to deal with me. My mom said, wait for your father to get home. <laughs> Anybody got one of those, wait till your father gets home? That's the worst thing in the world to ever do to a kid. You know why? I didn't want to see my dad. Didn't want to see my dad. Because I knew it was coming. When my dad got home, I was going to get my butt whooped. Come on, you know. Wait for your, I'm not even dealing with you. Wait for your father to get home. So now when my dad came home, I wasn't like, Dad, I love you. No, I was in my bedroom putting on 22 pairs of underwear. <laughs> Don't think I did it. That is a true story. <laughs> right? Fear of your parents never builds a healthy relationship. And fear of a God it doesn't build a healthy relationship. It doesn't make you want to love him and serve him. It's like, I got to do I have to do this. I don't want to go to hell. have to do this. I want to go to hell. It is the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. Look it up. The goodness of God leads man to repentance. Not being scared to death of hell. 
Galatians 5, 1 says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then and do not be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. What he's saying is, do not be again burdened with the, the yoke of sin and death. Live in freedom. Does anybody remember the movie Braveheart? Come on, one of my favorite movies ever, Braveheart. You remember when he cries out the word freedom? What did it mean to feel chance, like? Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Come on, freedom. They'll never take it. The world can't have the freedom. The world can't have freedom in Jesus. They can't have it. But again, we're so underjoyed because we want to be credited for our behavior and our ability and our struggle, and our strength. I just find it funny. A lot of people want to live by works, but they're not disciplined enough to get out of bed the first time their alarm clock goes off. The moment you start hitting snooze button, you're already a liar. You're already a failure. You already failed. You already set your day up for failure every time you hit that snooze button. But you want to go judge someone else's behavior. Yet you snooze seven times. The Bible says, oh, we want to get to the Bible about sleep? A little extra sleep, a little extra slumber makes a man a lazy man. Makes him poor, it says. Oh, we want, oh, okay. But we want to pick on people's big sins. We want to get on social media and attack people. We want to put our opinion in on someone who sins differently than we sin. Because I'm not even talking about people behave differently. No, no, no. I'm just going to tell you straight out, you're a sin. Like, you sin a lot. Everything outside of faith is sin. Every time you doubt yourself, it's sin. C -c can we get for real? Right? Anytime you doubt yourself, you're doubting God. Because you were made in the image and the likeness of God. That the same spirit is in you that is in Christ. Therefore, when you doubt yourself, you doubt God. Can I tell you this? Every time you get frustrated with someone else, it's actually the fact that you doubt yourself. <laughs> Man, we make everything someone else's problem. No, your frustration with your kids is you doubt your ability to lead them and get what you want out of them. It's you. You are the problem. But we want to make it everybody else's problem. We want to make sin everyone else's problem. When you were saved, you were set free from the old man. Outwardly, you look the same, but inwardly, you have been changed. And the lifelong quest of a Christian is to let what happened on the inside work its way out to the outside. Now, some people do that faster than others. Some people make the inward conversion and immediately you can see it's only happened to me twice when I've prayed a salvation prayer for someone. I had my eyes closed and when I opened my eyes, they physically looked different in front of me. They accepted Jesus and man, the spirit of heaviness, the spirit of depression just left them and they glowed, they looked different. But 99.9% .9 of the people I've ever led to the Lord, it takes 10, 15 years to work out your salvation, the Bible says. Jesus died so that we could be free from the yoke of bondage. In the early church, the Judaizers were teaching that the Gentiles were Christians, but they still had to do more. The Judaizers were Christians, but if you really wanted to prove that you loved God, you really wanted to prove that you had converted, you had to be circumcised. And we would love to welcome you into the family of God this weekend. We would love every single one of you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you gotta prove you're really committed. 
you got to prove you're committed. We're cutting stuff out of our lives today. We're cutting stuff off today. Dear Lord, Pastor Mike, did you have to go that far? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely I did. Because this is what happens. Oh, wait, I have the Holy Spirit, but you need to clean yourself up first. I mean, after all, I had to stop certain things. You should too. Man, keep your eyes on your own paper, man. Listen, I can't be judging other people if my eyes are on Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. And, and can I just say this? Please don't spit on the gift that Jesus gave us by trying to mix works and grace. Well, Pastor Mike, you know, you just got to understand, there's got to be a balance. There's got to be a balance to works and grace, Pastor Mike. There's got, listen, can I just ask you a question? How do you balance Jesus Christ dying on the cross? How do you balance that? How do you balance that him who knew no sin became sin that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? How do you balance that? How do you balance that he did all the work and we receive all the benefits? You don't balance that, but you do live a life of love toward God. And because I love you, God, I want to serve you and I want to live for you. See, guilt and shame and thinking that you're the worst Christian in the world is not from God. Is not from God. When you get any sort of, of, of anxiety about past behaviors or, or shame or guilt, that's not God doing this. not the Holy Spirit convicting you. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. That he will try to keep reminding you of your sin. Why? Because you will never step out in faith if you don't accept God's grace. You won't do it. You won't step out in faith. You won't do outlandish, faith-filled things if you don't think God has your back. Right here on this stage, every single one of my kids, as I raised them, I'd make them stand on the edge of that stage and jump into my arms. Make daddy catch them. Anybody ever did that with their kids or you did that with your parents? Maybe it's on the stairs and your kids would jump and you catch them and it was fun. And then after about five minutes, you were done and they kept wanting to play it. Huh? But your kid stands there and they're like. Because <laughs> they're just not sure if you're going to catch them. A lot of Christians. God, I want to. God, I do, God, I want to. I want to trust you, God. I want to serve you, God. I want to be used by you. I want to change the world. But will you catch me? Will you hold me? Will you keep me up? If I do this, God, if I do it, will you protect me? Will you keep me safe? And because we don't believe in his grace, we don't ever jump. There were 12 disciples in the boat and only Peter walked on water. All the others were like, look at me too. But they never tried. They never even tried. They never even trusted Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to us. He says, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He didn't say get saved first. He didn't say clean up first. He didn't say put deodorant on first. He didn't say brush your teeth from the stale beer from the hangover from last night. Then you can come to me. He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. And he didn't say, I'd even correct you. He didn't say, I'd discipline you. He didn't say, I'd fix you. He said, I'd give you rest. Give you rest. So, so many believers are just tired. Tired Christians fighting the fight of faith. And they were actually supposed to be in rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Galatians 5, 2, Paul speaks to us again and says, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, listen, if we go down this road, then Christ will be of no value to you. He's saying, if you want to go back to this law, then you didn't accept Christ. If you want to go back to works and earning it, then you don't understand what Jesus Christ did for you. That's what he's saying here. If you think you can earn it by behavior and traditions, you forgot what the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So let's talk about this. Who has fallen from grace? Who has fallen from grace? Most people would say, answer, well, you know, if you sin, fall into grace. You're falling into sin, right? I just fell into sin. Christians don't fall into sin. Christians fall into grace. Yeah, but I've done bad things. I, yeah, you have. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd be in hell. That's why I fall into grace. Again and again and again. Again and again. Every time you fall into his grace. You can't fall from grace. You fall into grace. If sin could separate you from grace, then you could never have actually been born again. Because you were guilty of the sin of the rejection of Jesus Christ before you came to Christ. And you've been saved by grace through faith. It's what brought you in to a relationship with him. What good is grace if sin separates you from God? Because we cannot go through life without sinning. Thanksgiving dinner is another example. We probably overate. And gluttony is a sin. The, third, you know, the first piece of pie was okay, but the third piece of pie? You better go confess that. Come on, somebody. Galatians 5, 4 says, who has fallen from grace? Those who are trying to be justified by the law. Those who are trying to earn it. Living under the law causes us to fall from grace, but we, as believers, when we mess up, we fall into grace. So, if you don't know this by now, I'm a big grace preacher. My dad was a righteousness teacher. Everything I know about grace, I learned from him in righteousness, but grace takes it even a little step further. Righteousness told us that we have right standing with God, that we are seated in heavenly place at the right hand of the Father. But what righteousness told us was that spiritually we are perfect, but conditionally, so, so positionally versus conditionally, and conditionally we're still fallen, and because of our condition, we're still sep we can be separated from God. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that because if I'm seated in heavenly places with my heavenly Father, I can never be separated from him. Even conditionally, even conditionally, sin has been condemned to the flesh. Whose flesh? Not mine. Jesus is on the cross. It was condemned to the flesh. But this is what I've heard. This is what I've been told. Because I've been preaching this message since I was 17 years old. Pastor Mike, or Mike, little Mike, Joe Jr. If you preach too much grace, people are going to go sin. Pastor Mike, you preach too much grace. People are going to sin. Okay. You sin it anyway. You went to Catholic church your whole life. You're still sinning. You went to the Pentecostal church. You were still sinning. Come on, you Pentecostals. You know you had to wear that skirt all the way down here. But the moment you left the house, you rolled it up. Sinner. You're sinning. Disobeying. Anger. 
But here's the logic. Here's the logic to that statement, okay? If you preach too much grace, Pastor Mike, people are going to sin, okay? So if I preach too much healing, then people are going to get sick. If I preach too much peace of God, people are going to get confused. If I preach too much of how to hear the voice of God, they're going to hear the voice of the devil. That's what your logic says. That's what the logic says. If I preach too much grace, people are going to sin. That's what it says. So if I preach too much healing, everybody here getting COVID. So let's not do it. And that's the trick. That's the trick. So don't preach about it. Leave everybody in bondage. Leave everybody standing on the edge of life. Wanting to do big things. But not sure would qualify. God, will you really do what you promised even though I haven't done what I promised? Yeah, he will. Because he's not like you. And he's not like me. He's a good God. He's not moved by emotion. He's not moved by your behavior. Galatians 5.13 tells us this. You, my brothers, were called to be free. But listen, you've been called to be free. But don't use that freedom to indulge in sin. Rather, you should love one another. Could you imagine that we loved one another instead of judging one another? There's a big difference between I'm not allowed to sin which is the law, and I don't want to sin, which is love. I can't do that. It's against my religion. That's law. I don't want to do that because that doesn't please God. That's love. So why did we have the law? Why are we given the Old Covenant, the Old Testament? It was, the Bible says it was our schoolmaster, our teacher, to point us to Christ, to show us that we could not do this without a Savior. Let me ask you real quick. Did anybody notice that I have a lift sitting right here next to me during worship? And did you wonder why they would leave that out during church and someone not put that away? What kind of a Miss Lynn would never stand for that in this church? What's this boy thinking about? Did you look at the ceiling above the lift? There's a gold medal hanging up there. I want you all to just jump and grab that medal from the ceiling. It's right there. It's right there. It's only 20 feet in the air. It's only 20 feet. Can anybody jump up there and get that medal off the ceiling? It's 20 feet high. Can anybody jump up there and get that? It's right there. It's, it's right there. It's hanging right there. It's got a red, white, and blue. It has a gold medal. It's right there. I provided it for you. That's the mark. The gold prize is right there. Go ahead and get it. Jump up and get it. In your own effort, in your own power, in your own strength, jump up and get it. Can't, can you? But if I get in Christ... If I get into Christ, if I get in Christ, who's the way maker, who made a way where there's no way, who while we were yet sinners died for us, who said, who made himself low that we might be elevated. If I get in Christ and he brings me to the higher place, this is the goal, this is where the prize is, this is where it's at, it's all the way up here. I can't do it in my own effort. I can't do it in my own strength. I can't do it in my own deeds. But in Christ, he will elevate me to a place where maybe I don't deserve it. Maybe I have not done anything to get there except believe and call upon the name of the Lord. Hey, look at this. Hey, look at this. It's right here. See, it's easy to understand an illustration. It's hard to practice this in real life. You can understand that in my own strength, I could not jump up in here and reach it, but I've been given a mechanism, a machine. I've been given a way. 
I've been given away to change the light bulbs and to run cables, to reach the prize, to do what I need to do up, up at this height. It's easy to understand it, to see this, but it's very hard to live it when someone we know sins differently than we sin. I'm just asking today, can you extend grace to others the way God has extended grace to you? Can you extend grace to others the way that God extends? And if you guys report me to OSHA for not putting on that harness, I'm telling you right now. Someone thought it. Somebody thought it. None of us. None of us can fulfill the law. That's why God set the bar so high. He set the bar so high. He never wanted us to live by the law. Man asked for that. Man said, stop blessing us based upon your goodness and bless us based upon our ability to follow the law. And God said, okay, I'll make it impossible. I'm going to make it so impossible that you're going to cry out for a savior. You're going to cry out for a redeemer. You're going to cry out for a messiah. Because you can't be happy in your own deeds. You can't be full of joy in your own deeds. You can't. You can't. You can't have eternal life by being a good person. You can't be that good. You can't have every single day forever be a perfect day where you were just full of joy and loved on everybody. You're going to have a bad day. He says, I need to make a way to obtain the prize. It's my son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In John 8, 32, he said, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Ephesians 2, 6, and 7 says this, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. If you're hearing any other gospel than this, Paul said, you foolish Galatians, you've been bewitched. You've been bewitched. We should want to honor God with our lifestyle because we love him because we love him. The decisions that we make in our lives should be through the filter and the lenses of, I love God, will this please him? Instead of out of fear. We're so used to living in fear. Let your boss walk through the hallway while you're in a conversation with another coworker, what do you do? We're so used to living in fear. You're driving down the highway, you pass a police officer, what's the first thing you do? Why? Why? Fear. There's this instantaneous, automatic belief I'm doing something wrong. You passed that cop, you were only doing 60 and a 65. You let off your gas, you hit the brake, and then you're looking in the rear view. <laughs> Why? Because we've programmed ourselves to fear. God says we're not free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And if you have not experienced the freedom in Christ Jesus, I want to offer that to you today. I want to bring you into the family of God. And we're not going to do this today. We're just going to pray a prayer. We're going to pray a prayer. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. And when you're saved, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives and dwells within you. It brings life to your soul. If you're here today or watching online and you make, need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, please pray this with me. And because we love you so much, we pray it as a community. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me 
and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type amen in one of our chat rooms or the little hand raise button? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our five-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you just wave at me and say, Pastor Mike, that was me. I prayed that for the first time today. Anybody at all real quick as I look across the room? Anybody real quick? Someone over here. Yeah, I see you, man. Awesome. Anybody else? Great, 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 great. Welcome, welcome, welcome. That same starting point book is available. One of our care team members or our ushers will have it. Also at the Welcome Center is available to you. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't really know about this church and God. And I really don't know about that message because I've never heard anything like that before. We have another book at the Welcome Center free of charge. It's called Welcome Home. It talks about what we believe in Christianity and, and, and our relationship with God. Go ahead and grab that at the Welcome Center. Pick it up. And if you know someone who may benefit from that, grab one. Uh, take it and give it to somebody. It would be a great, great blessing to their life. Father, we thank you today that this word will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. Lord, I pray today that our spiritual eyes would be alive and awakened to the truth of this gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, of what you came to this earth to do. So Lord, help us to live lives that demonstrate our love towards you. Help us to shake off the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups and the pains of the past that, that keep self-sabotaging our decisions. Help us to let go of the past and keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, as we leave here today, we're blessed. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.